Do you need some cards from today's episode? Well, you can pick them up and support the show from our sponsor, Card Kingdom. Just follow the link in the description box down below. Hello, everyone. It's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and Corset 2020 is here, which means it is time for us to break down the impact of our newest core set on some various constructed formats. And today, we are talking about the big one. We are talking about standard uh, core set 2020, unlike Modern Horizons, of course, a standard legal set, hopefully going to shake up the standard meta, if not immediately, then at least after rotation. So today, I am joined by everyone's favorite, Krim. How's it going today, Krim? <laughs> How you doing, Seth? Uh, I'm doing well, and we are going to break down our top 10 standard cards from Corset 2020. So before we jump into this, Grim, quick question for you. Uh, Corset 2020, it is a Corset kind of known to be more new player friendly, maybe a little bit less powerful sometimes than other standard sets. Uh, what do you feel about this set for standard? How powerful is it? Do you think it can shake up our standard meta pre-rotation? Are we looking towards rotation for these cards to make an impact? Where are you at with this set in general? I think this set is very powerful um, for a core set. And, you know, normally, like you had mentioned, core sets get a little, uh, li like, it, the, the, the you know, the cards, the design of the cards, the mechanics, they aren't, like, super crazy. They're a little more uh, simple to pick up on but we we brought back protection we brought back ley lines all these things like there's a lot going on in this core set yeah i think this is actually a very powerful core set and one of the most complex core sets we've seen in a while so we actually have a pretty sweet list of cards to talk about today we we got some good ones and i'm excited to break them down so let's jump right into it start talking about our core set 2020 cards starting with number 10 on our list and this one's actually a reprint a reprint that people are really hyped about for modern but also might do some stuff in standard and that is Leyline of the void so, Krim, uh, we're doing standard today. What are we doing with Leyline in our standard format? Well, with the recent rise, <laughs> not the not surprising rise of Esper, uh, and of course, like all the other graveyard decks, like Four Color, Dread Horde, all these things like that, um, there's, you know, there looks to be a lot of like graveyard synergies that you can really just like dunk on with this card and of course you know there's even new cards coming from this this exact core set that looks like it could be bringing some some more reanimation to the party yeah i mean we are in a pretty graveyard heavy standard format we have command the dread horde one of the best decks even esper is kind of just like playing some command the dread hordes for value sometimes a lot of decks from our Ravnica block have graveyard synergies. We have like the Is It Phoenix deck is still floating around sometimes. Jumpstart cards show up sometimes. A finale of oh, the red Promise. one. Promise, I yep. guess. The it, that should not. I always say finale of devastation. They, they really misname the finales, in my opinion. The red one should not be <laughs> Promise. That's more of like a white name. But we have a lot of graveyard stuff going on in Leyline, as we know for modern. This is just this is the hardest lock you can have on a graveyard in the format. It doesn't hurt you. It comes down on turn zero, and it basically just doesn't let your opponent put anything in the graveyard for the rest of the game. So uh, I feel like this is... Where are you at with this as far as actually seeing play, Krim? You play Esper. Is this something you're slotting into your sideboard like as soon as M20 comes out? Depends on how much like how much more graveyard-centric decks come out, of the, uh, out with like M20, but so far... I would consider it potentially because there's a lot of Soul Tide Dread Horde right now, just a ton of it on the ladder, um, and and it, it, it's because Soul Tide Dread Horde is a natural good matchup for like, against like it's good to like beat Esper with that and all these like there's a lot of graveyard stuff that I could see me wanting this in. The only issue is that it suffers from what pretty much every Leyline suffers from. Everyone after the first one that you draw feels kind of terrible. <laughs> yeah, no, that is that is a very good point. Additional copies, not super helpful. Although, like, I don't know, maybe people play their Chemister's Insights again or something, ways to filter away cards. But I, I agree with you. This is a card that maybe it shows up in sideboards immediately, maybe it doesn't, but it is a great safety valve for the next year of Standard to make sure that 
these graveyard decks don't get too out of control in the format. Correct. Well, let's move on. Speaking of graveyard decks, <laughs> number nine on our list, we have a card that <laughs> maybe it could create a new kind of graveyard deck, Blood for Bones. Basically, four mana reanimation does make you sack a creature, but has upside of also bouncing a creature back to your hand from your graveyard. Uh, so, Krim, is Reanimator going to be coming to standard with course at 2020? I mean, you have this, uh, you have the split card, uh, the Demir one. Uh, connive, concoct, and like, there, I think there's a lot of, uh, reanimation going on. Like, there's a ton of things you could be bringing back. Uh, there's even that new, like, seven drop blue creature from this set. I forgot what it's called, but yeah. There's, there's just a lot of reanimation targets, and there's a lot of, like, support coming in right now. So I, I like this. Cause this also not only brings something back to the, from the graveyard to the battlefield, it also returns one from your graveyard to your hand. So that's kind of something spicy, something new. I like that. Yeah, I think this card is very powerful, and like you said, there are some good big things to reanimate. It is going to take uh, kind of a new deck to develop for Blood for Bones to uh, make its mark in standard, but traditionally, in recent years, reanimation's five mana. We don't really get four mana reanimation spells. I don't think that sacking a creature is a huge downside. It does mean you can't play, like, a kind of a legacy-style reanimator deck where you don't play really any creatures other than reanimation targets. You do need to have, whatever, some random creatures floating around, which is fine. But at four mana, this is really powerful. And getting a card back from your graveyard to your hand, a really nice bonus. So I definitely plan on trying this card. And uh, we were just talking about Leyla, and are you worried at all about the amount of graveyard hate in the format? Like, <laughs> is that a reason to not build the Blood for Bones stack? Or is that just to make sure that Blood for Bones isn't too busted? I think it's more so that Blood for Bones isn't too busted. <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, I do we I know for the first couple of weeks we won't see I don't think we'll see a ton of ley lines. Right? Not until like the meta kind of settles in. But definitely think that ley line will help keep this card in check and other reanimation styles. Well, let's move on. Number eight on our list, we have maybe one of the most hyped cards from the set. That is Lotus Field, our new Black Lotus-style land. Yes, it does make you sacrifice a couple of lands when it comes into play, and uh, this is a tough one. This is one of the more speculative cards, I think, on our list, as far as the amount of play that it will see. It's a card that I feel like if... Someone figures out the right deck. It can be very powerful. We have some ways to untap lands in standard. We have like brought back, which is kind of a combo to get back the lands that you sacrifice. So there are ways that you can build around this. And when things come together, you're going to easily have like six mana on turn four or something, seven mana on turn four and be able to cast some really big, really powerful stuff. But the downside for this is I don't see a ready built home for this in standard. I don't think you just slot this in to any random deck without building around it. But what do you think about this one, Grim? Yeah, I think this is I agree with you there. There's going to it's going to have to go into like a brand new deck. Uh there there's people like just I there, you know, people memeing around talking about like Blood Sun and stuff like that for for the the time that it's it's legal, but I don't know what this goes in yet, but once you figure it out, there, there's going to be some really like ridiculous things going on. What do you think like this makes 3 mana. You have to sacrifice two lands. So Essentially, if you're not built around it at all, yeah. you are still making your land drop, essentially. It does come into play tap, but you're still going to have the same amount of mana. Is there any argument to playing this in a fair deck that's not built around it? I don't think so. I don't know. This seems kind of risky. Like I definitely don't want it because like, a fair deck, wanting to curve out, do all that, kind of needs its land like on turn one and two. And if I draw this anywhere and like it's my only land drop, <laughs> it's going to feel pretty bad. Yeah, you have the four Lotus Field opener, and you're just like, uh, yeah. no, no, so much mana, but so little mana. <laughs> yeah, London Mulligan will maybe help m mitigate that, but like, still, feels pretty bad if like this is supposed to be your land drop on one or two. Well, let's move on from our speculative land to a cycle of mythics coming in at seven on our list. And here we don't have all of them, but there's a few that we want to talk about from the Cavalier cycle. I know, Krim, you were high on especially the white one and the blue one. And I wanted to throw up the green one because I've seen recently, this was a card I was kind of like sleeping on and like, ah, oh, I don't know. You're going to whiff sometimes with the enter the battlefield trigger. Is it really worth it? But I've seen some really good players uh, talking about this 
this card, talking about buying this card. So I'm feeling like maybe it's a little bit better than I gave it credit for. Uh, so what do you think about these Cavaliers in Standard, Grim? Well, the, the cycle of Cavaliers, for the most part, are, I guess, a watered down and a, like, a little, a watered down and a half version of Titans. Uh, and I think they're, they're, they're good. Some of them are, are, are pretty good. Like I, I told you, I love the Cavalier of Dawn because that one, when it comes down, it blows up a non-land permanent, right? The white one, and then it gives them a 3-3 golem, uh, artifact golem. And when it dies, return target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. The, the thing is, the back half of it, when it dies, We'll see how relevant that is, but I just love the fact that you get a 4-6 Vigilant creature that can blow up any non-land permanent, and especially with War of the Spark and all of that, I can definitely name a few non-land permanents to, like, I- I'd gladly give them a golem for. Yeah, the flexibility is huge. It snipes all the Planeswalkers. It snipes Wilderness Reclamation, which we've seen. Uh, it snipes random, I don't know, Immortal Suns artifacts that are floating around. So the fact that this gets anything is nice, and it's kind of cute that, worst case, you can like upgrade one of your own things uh, and get a 3 3 on your side of the battlefield. And then you're getting a lot of power and toughness if you're just trying to like go aggro and you're in a situation where your opponent has nothing good to kill. So yeah. it seems pretty powerful thanks to its flexibility. What about the blue one, Cavalier of Gales? Uh, where Where is this one going, Grim? Is this showing up in your Esper control deck? <laughs> I don't know if I'm putting it in an Esper control deck or may, may like, I, I like it because it is a flying, uh, you know, it enters the battlefield, draws three, and then puts two from your hand on top of your library. But when it dies, shuffle it into its owner's library, then scry two. Like this and this could be pretty sweet, uh, in multiples too. Like, it, like you can, like if it dies immediately when it comes down and you put like a bunch of dead cards on the top, you can immediately scry those to the bottom. Or I mean, you shuffle it, your library, and then you get to scry and fix your next set of draws. So I don't know. It, yeah. I don't know which ver- what deck this is going to go in, but I do like this card a lot. Maybe maybe some uh mono blue like mid-range. <laughs> I have no clue right now with this deck cuz it is with this card. It is triple blue, so that is a cost. All these cavaliers have a very very pricey uh cost. And it is a 5/5 five, five flyer. Like that's a pretty legitimate clock. It's like Lyra. You get different upsides obviously, but 5/5 five, five flyer closes out the game pretty quickly. I know one place I really love this card is in Vanifar decks. The, the yeah. brainstorm ability so perfect if you're playing Vanifar. And Vanifar, it's definitely fringe right now. It's fallen behind the Planeswalker decks and whatnot, but we're coming to rotation. Stuff is going to change. Uh but the brainstorm ability super good cuz in Vanifar you often have a curve where especially in the top end, like six mana, five mana even, you don't have too many creatures of that converted mana cost, so your chain can fizzle if you draw those creatures in your hand. And Cavalier, it gives you a good threat that you can tutor out and put those creatures back on the top of your deck and then maybe even shuffle them away, and then you can tutor them up later with your Vanifar. So I really like it there. Yeah, and, and like, th- just... Just like I had mentioned uh, a while back, like right now with the way the format is, if your creature enters the battlefield and doesn't do anything or leave something behind, uh, because potentially getting bounced or, or anything like that, uh, y- it feels like it's just not that great of a card. So this does something immediately when it, it, it enters. So I like that. And that's really an upside of the whole Cavalier cycle is you are getting value right away. And then uh, Cavalier of Thorns, as I kind of mentioned in the intro of these cards... It's a card at first, I was like, I don't know, I don't think this card is that good. You get the Elvish uh, Reclaimer, is that, is that what the, the one that looks at your top five is, the three drop? Elvish, Elvish something. I was, I was thinking of the, the ramp one, the, yeah, I think it might be Elvish Reclaimer, is it? The three mana corset one, the one. Yeah, one. the three mana one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be reclaimer, but you kind of get that when it enters the battlefield. Hopefully, a ramp spell, and then putting something back on top of your deck when it dies. It does have nice abilities. It has a nice body. It's really good at blocking a lot of the flying threats in the format. This is going to lock down rekindling phoenix, lyras, any of the big flyers. This has that big reaching body to take care of it. So uh, this one's kind of growing on me a little bit. Combine the stats and the abilities with the fact that I know really good players are high on this card, and I think it might be kind of one of the sleeper Cavaliers from the set. Well, let's move on. 
to number six on our list. We got a simple one. Uh, Krim, are you already having nightmares about this card? Uh, that is Fry, our new instant speed removal for white creatures or blue creatures or white or blue planeswalkers. So, uh, Krim, what's going on with this one in standard? It's that last bit of text there. Before, you know, we had uh, combustion or whatever. And, and like it had dealt five damage to a white or blue creature, but now we're able to hit a planeswalker. That's huge. This, this format has so many white and blue, like creatures or planeswalkers that you definitely want to deal five to. Like, like all the Teferis, Lyra's, just like about anything and everything that you could think of. It, like, it, it, it almost hits it right now, right? Like there's few cards that this doesn't hit that's problematic. Yeah. We just had the Mythic Championship a couple of weeks ago and, I think over 50% of the decks were playing essentially four of each Teferi and some, some number of Narsets. So even just sniping those Planeswalkers uncounterably for two mana instant speed, uh, that's really nice. Also, all those Planeswalkers happen to uh, have five loyalty, depending on if you plus them right away. Narset starts with five. So it's a really good way to kill those Planeswalkers. And uh, White Aggro still running around. Lyra, one of the most popular creatures in the format. So this mm-hmm. one... It feels like a all-star sideboard card. I'm not sure maybe the metagame is in such a crazy place with so many Teferis running around. You could talk about main decking it, but I think it's more like a card that you're really going to want to have in your sideboard of basically all your red decks. Yeah, if you can play it, definitely throw it in there. Because, I mean, this also, what, this hits, like, all the boluses, everything. It just, what doesn't it hit? (laughs) Yeah, it, it is way more flexible than you would think when you read the two-color restriction, and uh seems like a really powerful removal spell. Yeah, definitely. Moving on to number five on our list, and uh, talking about hating out on Planeswalkers, we have Tails and our new Stifle that can also randomly counter a legendary spell. And we're just talking about 50% of the meta at the Mythic Championship, playing all these Teferis and Narsets and Lyra being popular. So there's actually a lot of legendary spells you can hit with that. Is that enough, Krim, for Tail's End to be a standard staple post-M20? Uh, you know, I think this is definitely solid in some numbers. And, like, we, this is a card I definitely could see me main decking a few copies of, because... As, as you had mentioned, it, there are a ton of planeswalkers running around. Uh, and, and, you know, sure, there's even random, like, immortal suns and stuff like that. So just, just lots of legendary things running around right now that you want to counter. Um, and of course, it can eat an ultimate. So, like, it, you know, those, those games where they go elder spell for the exact amount of planeswalkers, let's just say to Emblem Teferi or, or Nico Bolas or something like that. You can go ahead and pick this off. Being able to snag like Teferi Ultimate is just absolutely insane. So we saw that with Disallow, which was kind of our last version of this effect. And this is a little more restricted. You can't just counter anything. But because we're in such a legendary heavy format right now, uh, you actually hit something from basically every deck. I guess it's probably bad against Mono Red in specific, but you basically- can stifle- how- like the Viachinos, right? Yeah, Chain Whirler Trigger. Yeah. <laughs> no, there, no, sir. <laughs> there's a solid chunk of, and especially with M20, there's going to be a ton of, tr- like, you know, ETB effects that you want to, like, counter. Uh, that is that is also true. And even the decks that aren't Super Friends decks, like Gruul, for example, even those decks are playing a decent amount of Planeswalkers. So I think it might be flexible enough, thanks to War of the Spark and all the Planeswalkers, that you can actually talk about running this in your main deck and having it actually be legit. Although, you mentioned this when we were talking before recording, a little bit annoying that uh, Three Fairy shuts it down <laughs> with its static ability. <laughs> yes. To Fairy is the... Reason why you may want to play a few of these, but like any time after a Teferi is resolved, this card feels very bad. <laughs> like it, it, that, that's the problem. So I don't know how many, like I'm not playing four of these, right? Unless I'm really trying to counter a planeswalker or something like that. Like this, this card actually outside of, uh, like it, it'll never counter anything outside of like maybe a Chandra against like red deck or a Gideon out of mono white or, like, yeah, like, it's just those. But, uh, th- this, this does hit all the mid-range decks fairly hard. So I like that. 
Yeah, and it is also nice that it's two mana, which means yep. uh, it's going to be able to be cast before three fairy comes down, regardless of whether you're on the player of the draw. So that is a nice upside compared to a lot of the counters we have in standard, which kind of start at the three mana range for the most playable ones. So maybe that's enough upside that it allows you to fight against uh, Teferi Time Raveler. Although, yeah, uh, getting wrecked by the static is that is a little bit brutal. Yeah, like, this instantly becomes the worst card in your deck. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could still stifle something at instant speed. No, or, no. or at sorcery <laughs> speed, rather. <laughs> yeah. Like you're, yeah, what is... Yeah. You All can't right, even stifle mind. anything. Uh, all right, maybe Teferi just ruins everything. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Number four on our list. Speaking of Teferis, this is a card I'm high on because I feel like this is another Teferi answer. Shifting Ceratops. Uh, I think this card is pretty legit. Four mana, five, four, already strong. You can give it haste so it can come down and smash into Teferi. Can't be tucked by Teferi. Can't be bounced by Teferi. Uh, can't be countered. Not super duper relevant right now because we we're just talking about how Teferi has kind of like pushed a lot of counter spells out of the format, at least out of main decks, but it's got good stats. Protection is very powerful and we have a lot of blue decks running around where protection can be relevant for some of the removal in the format. So as the Teferi player, Krim, uh, is this a legitimate answer to what you're trying to do? It's definitely a problem. Because you can give it haste and, you know, immediately kill a hero of Dominaria uh, for five mana. I I spend five mana, I play Teferi, I plus, you spend f like four mana and then pay one and then you kill my Teferi immediately. Uh, and the protection from blue is relevant because, you know, can't get tucked from a Teferi, can't get bounced by a Teferi. Uh, it, it's, it's just going to require like hard removal like cast down and stuff like that so if this becomes a big enough issue then cast down uh definitely comes back into play again and and things like that and like mortifies and, and etc etc just a very yeah, solid card definitely a solid card reminds me a little bit of miscutter hydra which definitely. was was played back in the day the hasty pro blue can't be countered threat and uh that meta game was very different we were in a very mono colored meta with like mono blue devotion but that was a all-star at fighting specific decks back in the day and i feel like shifting ceratops in some ways it's even more efficient it doesn't scale as much but it's got a lot of text on there and even just a five four for four with this upside it's a pretty legitimate body on its own i feel like this is uh what do you think about the comparison between this and like car Carnage Tyrant. Is this on the same level <laughs> as far as hating on control decks as Carnage Tyrant? No, because uh, Carnage Tyrant, you just don't interact with, right? Like, it's just like hexproof. So cool. <laughs> and it already has trample and it can't be countered. And, I, and I'm willing to, like, you know, lose out on haste and reach <laughs> for that. This, however, uh, like you had, is a little bit cheaper. I do like that. And on top of it, you, like where the, the haste may not matter or something like that, or you could still just play this on four and it's a solid body, as you had mentioned. Then the turn after, you can give it trample. You can also give it reach, which is huge. And I like that. The flexibility on that activated ability is always nice. Well, let's move on from the world of dinosaurs to the world of wraths. Number three on our <laughs> list. We actually have a reprint that we have in standard for a minute now. Planner cleansing, an expensive wrath. Six mana, triple white, but blows up all non-land permanents, which, uh, non-land permanents, kind of a big deal in our current standard because all the planeswalkers. Uh, is this a planeswalker answer, Krim? Is that what you're seeing this as mostly? Yes. I mean, the, the issue is sometimes you just fall behind on the board and there's like, you know, the, the opponent can go and split their threats up. I'm going to deploy enough planeswalkers and enough creatures to hit you from multiple angles. Maybe throw in a few like Ixlon's bindings on something relevant of yours and whatnot. This deals with all of that. Uh, yes, it is a real mana cost with a uh, triple white, but it's always nice to have like an emergency. Oh, uh, I'm in a pickle button, right? Like, and, and this kind of does that. So, like, it undoes, it, it's a clean reset on the board, and I've been begging for this to come back to standard for some time, especially after War of the Spark. Yeah, I think having a card that can answer multiple planeswalkers at once that also deals with creatures, really huge. Uh, you were talking about exactly, like, kind of the play pattern where there's, like, uh, a hero out that's making a bunch of tokens and making creatures, and you gotta deal with those, but there's also, like, two or three planeswalkers that are generating value. This gives you one card that gets rid of all of them. Sure, like, Elder Spell 
Kyle gets the planeswalkers and Kaya's Wrath gets the creatures, but you're still losing to like the other permanents that are on the battlefield. This is just like, all right, I'm answering all the problems at once, getting rid of all of it with also the upside, like you said, of getting an Ixalan's binding or whatever random artifact or enchantment might be laying around. So seems like a really good wrath. Is this something that is competing with Kaya's Wrath, Cleansing Nova, or is this uh, something you just play a copy or two on top of to be your, oh my goodness, everything's going wrong, save me please, Planner Cleansing? (laughs) Definitely the, oh my god, something's gone wrong uh, path. (laughs) I'm playing maybe like two of these and three Kaya's Wraths or something like that. Uh, It's it's just, once again, just very solid, and like with Command the Dread Horde running around, immediately after Command the Dread Horde, you can play this. Yeah. No, that is a, a great way to counteract Command the Dread Horde and get rid of everything that's gotten back, which is pretty huge deal. So definitely a super sweet reprint and probably going to see a decent amount of play, especially from uh, controlling decks. Yeah, much needed reprint. Let's move on. Number two on our list. We enter the world of Planeswalkers with Vivian Arcbow Ranger. And uh, this is kind of the opposite of the Planeswalkers you normally play, Grim. Rather than dirtling and drawing cards, <laughs> this one's kind of just like kidding. Killing people, plussing, putting counters on things, fighting planeswalkers. Uh, I think this card has a lot of potential in some sort of like mono green or gruel stompy list. Obviously, we've talked about this before. Triple green does limit the decks you can play it in. But if you can get this on the battlefield in a mostly green aggro deck, this card's going to close out the game super, super quickly. But what do you think about it? Absolutely just power, like a powerhouse. I think this is sweet because it's distribute two one one counters among up to two target creatures. So you can split the counters if you want to uh you can even put this on like uh the the druid the zero two with adapt and then you know make a ton of mana not that the and then like the the additional text on top of that is if you do put it on an, uh, like a bunch of uh, big creatures you get to then put trample like they they get trample i think that plus one is absolutely powerful and of course the minus three allows you to fight uh but it doesn't even fight sorry it just deals its damage uh, equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker. That is huge. You can send the damage to a planeswalker. If it's a big creature, a 5-5 five, five versus a 5-5, five, five, you get rid of the 5-5 five, five without losing yours because it's not fighting. And of course, there's the wish. Yeah, I think the wish ability is very powerful as well. I think that's kind of maybe like a backup ability. I think you use it, but I think you play this card because it's such an efficient card if you're trying to beat down, and it's so flexible. Like, the plus one works with your aggro plan. Negative three gets rid of blockers or planeswalkers, which is super helpful in our current format. And then you can do kind of the Karn trick with the negative five, where you snipe a uh, graveyard hate creature. You snipe a, I don't know, a knight of autumn to gain some life against mono red. So there is a lot of flexibility, or a carnage tyrant, or a Sarah tops to deal with a counter spell heavy deck so the flexibility is is very impressive and uh we have a lot of silver bullet creatures that you can play in the graveyard there are a lot of or play in your uh, sideboard there are a lot of good options available to the point where i think you can actually build a better vivian sideboard than you can card sideboard i've seen some card sideboards where i'm like "Eh," like yeah you have like five good artifacts but then you have like silent darts and just like "Eh, i don't know like i guess it's five sometimes, but I think it's way easier to play 15 strong creatures in your sideboard than 15 strong artifacts in standard. Yeah, definitely agree. Currently right now, that is the, you know, as someone that's been, like, you know, noodling around with Karn sideboards, I think this this one is definitely easier to build around with a lot more power. And and once again, like, the, the plus one, I cannot stress enough, like, how sweet that is. I mean, you turn your 1-1 one, one land war elves into actual threats. Yeah, it's almost like putting a ranker on your creature every turn. Like, yeah. it, that's that's what it kind of reminds me of. And Ranker's busted. Ranker is very strong. The trample just really makes that ability. So, yeah, uh, I think Vivian definitely going to see a lot of play in decks that can cast it. Yep. Uh, moving on, number one on our list, and I think, like... This is exactly what Wizards would want at number one on our list. We are in a Chandra set. We have our mythic Chandra, Chandra Awakened Inferno, kind of the the big face card of the set. And it seems like in this case, the power level is matching the hype. So big yeah. mythic six mana Chandra. Where are you playing this powerful Planeswalker, Grim? Uh, I, there, there's, I'm looking at Grixis right now because the ability for Nico Bolish Dragon God to copy the plus two to then just give an opponent two <laughs> emblems 
in one turn is like it seems like Christmas landy, but it, it it actually feels sweet. And you know, Chandra comes down and is a way to protect your your board. Uh, it's it's got two board sweep abilities, or I mean, one board sweep ability, and then a minus to deal with any problematic tournament up uh, tournament up uh, permanent, and then like just exile it. Just exile it. Get rid of it. I love it. Get rid of a Rekindling Phoenix. Get rid of a, a, a Planeswalker. So all these Planeswalkers from the set so far are coming down and have ways to deal with opposing Planeswalkers, which I'm really liking. Yeah, this, it feels a little bit like, uh, like Ugin to some extent, but with so much additional upside. Like, it has that ability to come down and basically kill any Planeswalker in the format. The negative three is actually really relevant against aggro decks if you're playing mono red some of the white based aggro decks you kind of have this sweeper and then the emblem's going to close out the game we have seen like Jeskai planeswalkers at various times be a thing a little bit out mm-hmm. of fashion right now but it would be an easy home there maybe some sort of like Jeskai control four color planeswalker decks uh so there is definitely a lot of places where you can play this and it is good against control it is good against aggro it is good against mid-range it just kind of hits on every single matchup if they if they wanted to push a main character of a set they've definitely done so with this card so <laughs> i mean it resolves right we know that <laughs> yeah it, it is coming down it is not being countered and i expect chandra to be really scary i'm actually really scared of the plus two uh especially with how grindy the format can be right now with all like the command the dread hordes and esper controls we got a lot of really grindy decks and i think that that plus two making a couple emblems that's going to be a really obnoxious way to close out the game that's a way that you close out the game through to fair emblems like you get the yep. emblem like Deferi can't exile an emblem so sure exile all my permanence opponent like you're still gonna lose the game to that plus two correct i mean i, I don't know how, how like it puts the clock on slow dirtily decks and we're in a pretty slow i mean I maybe that's wrong. There are definitely aggro decks in the format, but a lot of the best decks in standard right now are slow dirtily decks, which means Chandra might have a chance to shine pretty much immediately, I think, after M20 comes out. Yeah, I I don't think this needs to wait till rotation or anything. This is just getting played if a deck can like if there is something with red, I think I'm probably playing it. And I think that that brings us to the end of our top ten core set 2020 cards for standard. So Krim. Thank you so much for hanging out. It's always fun to do these. Uh, Yeah, always a blast to hang with you. And thanks to everyone for watching. So let us know what you think of the comments. Uh, You saw our top 10 cards. What are your top 10 cards? What do we miss? What else is good? What is bad? Let us know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed it, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video! If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button! And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos! And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here!